Hey, Shalom, and welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard. My name is Adam, and tonight we're going to be discussing the book of First Enoch. Is it or is it not Scripture? Okay, so everything we're going to be discussing today is found on an article form here on parableofthevineyard.com. I'll make sure to put a link in the description box below and as a pinned comment. So let's get right into it. The book of Enoch has become quite the topic of discussion for many believers in these last days. Some find immense value in the book and would even venture to call it scripture. However, many scholars reject Enoch and subsequently pastors and ultimately most Christians do the same. Many call it a Jewish fable, a book of mysticism, or perhaps at best, a book with some historical value, but certainly not scripture. What's the truth? We believe First Enoch to be divinely inspired, and we hope you stick around to examine the evidence with us. So let's get started. So let's start with 2 Timothy 2.15. Some wise words from the Apostle Paul says, Study to show yourself approved unto Elohim. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. So before we begin, just a real quick thing on the names. In this study, we will be using the Hebrew names and or titles for our Heavenly Father and His Son. Please forgive us for any confusion. However, we have recognized that using the Hebrew names to the best of our understanding to be an immense blessing in our walk. We also respect and understand that there are varying interpretations of the pronunciations and pray our current understanding does not offend or take away from this study. If you believe we pronounce the name incorrectly, consider just praying for us. So here are some of the terms we're going to use here. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God. Uh, yod heh vav heh that's the Tetragrammaton, uh, the name of our Heavenly Father. We pronounce it Yahuwah. Others say Yahweh, Yehovah, etc. And then lastly, Yahusha. Uh, This is the name of the Son of Yahuwah, our Savior, Messiah, and King, also known as Yeshua or Yeshua. So let's get to the point here. In this study, we will explore various topics of discussion surrounding the book of Enoch. Number one, isn't Yahuwah powerful enough to keep his word intact? As in answering why Enoch isn't in the canon, sorry, also known as the Bible. Did Yahuwah close the canon with the 39 books of the Old Testament, uh, which is also the same as the 24 books of the Tanakh? We'll explain that here in just a little bit. Number three, Jude quoted Enoch. Does that carry any weight? Number four, what does Enoch teach about Messiah, the son of Yahuwah the Most High? Number five, Enoch 7114 and the son of man discrepancy. Number six, does does Messiah reference Enoch? Number seven, Peter taught from Enoch, is that significant? Number eight, existing manuscript evidence and the Ethiopic Bible. Number nine, what did the early church fathers or the ancient scholars say regarding Enoch. And then lastly, number 10, other information found within this text. So let's get right to it. Isn't Yahuwah powerful enough to keep his word intact? I can understand this question. So before we begin, we need to clarify that we are discussing first Enoch only. Second and third Enoch exist, but we are are not deliberating those. The primary objection to first Enoch is why isn't in the Bible? It's a good question. We know that nothing is too hard for our Heavenly Father, and nothing has slipped past Him. We believe this book was concealed by Yahuwah on purpose, I'm sorry, to serve His purpose, excuse me. So Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of Yahuwah to conceal a thing, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. So it's up to Him if He wants to make something hidden to be searched after. That's his will. And it's the, he says it's the glory or the honor of kings, excuse me, to, to search it out. And so I think this, pet, this picture is a representation of when we go searching for matters like this. We believe it was Yahweh's plan to conceal Enoch for the end times generation whom this book was written to stated plainly in the first two verses. And many of you out there may agree, we believe that we are the end times generation. How, how long we have, I don't exactly know. But Paul says that we would know the season and looking at the signs of the times, we believe that we are. So we believe this book was written for our generation. So we're going to back this claim momentarily. 
Let's get right to 1 Enoch chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, the, very, the first two verses in this book. Let's read it together. The words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, listen to this, who will be living in a day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by Elohim, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything. And from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation. So he's like, this is you know, thousands of years ago. He's like, I'm not writing it for this generation. Listen, but for a remote one, which is for to come, a, a far distant uh, generation, which I do believe he is uh, talking to us. And we'll, again, we'll back this up. How amazing. Here's another indicator of who the book was written for. First Enoch, chapter 108, verse 1. Another book which Enoch wrote for his son Methuselah and for those who will come, come after him and keep the law or the Torah in the last days. So this book, con this book confirms the teachings of the Torah and prophets continuously throughout its pages. We've often heard the statement, Enoch is dangerous, or Enoch leads you away from Christ. These statements could not be further from the truth, brothers and sisters. As we will see shortly, first Enoch has some of the most vivid prophecies regarding Messiah. Also, this book continuously exhorts the reader to walk in righteousness according to the divine law, the Torah. For many of us, we already have an understanding that the law already existed before it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. So people will say, well, how can he be referencing the law when the law didn't come until Mount Sinai? Which actually isn't true. When we see that here in Genesis 26, 5, now this is... Um, this is the Most High speaking to Isaac about his father. It says, I will make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto your seed all these countries and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Listen to this. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. This is way before Sinai or roughly 400 years. To be quite candid, my wife and I, and many others, hold testimonies that bears witness to the truth of Enoch. This was the book that Yahweh used to help wake us up to truly follow his ways according to how he commanded it, faith and obedience. Point blank is books uh, like Enoch and, and a few others that solidified, hey, we need to be keeping the, the commandments of the Most High. So this book has borne good fruit in my life and in many others based off our testimonies. So this book is a reward, in my opinion. Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to Yahuwah must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Books like First Enoch, the Apocrypha, and others are a gift from above. Truly a reward for those that diligently seek out this matter. Speaking of the Apocrypha, we would be doing you a huge disservice if we didn't share a few passages from the book of 2nd Ezra, also known as 4th Ezra. This is written by the same Ezra in the Bible, which weighs in on the matter. However, before we do, we acknowledge that 2nd Ezra is also not in the 66 book canon, so it's not in the Bible. Actually, what it isn't is in many, I'll explain that. However, it was considered scripture for many centuries. It was included in the 1611 KJV Bible, probably the most uh, well-known Bible, well, regardless of your feelings about it, this was probably the most well-known Bible over the last five, six hundred years. Uh, five hundred years. <laughs> so it was included in the 611 KJV Bible. Uh, it was included in the 1560 Geneva Bible, another huge canon. The Orthodox Slavonic Bible, the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible, the Russian uh, Synodal Bible, the Latin Vulgate, and it was also widely cited by early ch fathers of the church. So here in 2 Ezra 14, Ezra is visited and is told this. And so all everything we're about to share with you, it really is um, backing up the claim that this book is a reward, that this book was hidden uh, by our Heavenly Father on purpose uh, and a reward for those that diligently seek out the matter. So I want to back that up with uh, what Second Ezra has to weigh in on the matter. So Second Ezra chapter 14, verses 1 through 6 says this, On the third day, while I was sitting under an oak, Behold, a voice came out up of a bush opposite me and said, Ezra, Ezra. And I said, Here am I, master. And I rose to my feet. Then he said to me, 
I revealed myself in a bush and spoke to Moses when my people were in bondage in Egypt. And I sent him and led my people out of Egypt. And I led him up on Mount Sinai where I kept him with me many days. And I told him many wondrous things and showed him the secrets of the times and declared, declared to him the end of the times. Then I commanded him saying, these words you shall publish openly and these you shall keep secret. So, so what this is saying, and we believe this book is true, is the Most High is saying that when he gave his word to Moses, he said, hey, these, these certain words will be for everyone to read, and these will be kept in, these shall be kept in secret. So once again, remember, it's the glory of Yahweh to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Next, Ezra makes a, pet a petition to Yahuwah to restore the scriptures because they were destroyed during the invasion and deportation by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army. So here we are in 2 Ezra 14, 19-22. Then I answered and said, Let me speak in your presence, Master. For behold, I will go as you have commanded me, and I will reprove the people who are now living, but who will warn those who will be born hereafter? For the world lies in darkness, and its inhabitants are without light. For your law has been burned, and so no one knows the things which have been done or will be done by you. If then I have found favor before you, send the Holy Spirit into me, and I will write everything that has happened in the world from the beginning, the things which were written in your law. And listen to this. That men may be able to find the path, and that those who wish to live in the last days may live. So, hallelujah, I think we should all be very thankful to Ezra's petition, or for Ezra's petition. Now, for the last portion of 2 Ezra, we will see why this passage is vital to understanding and demystifying the concept of a closed canon that excludes First Enoch. So, this is the end of chapter 14. And my mouth was open, so, of course, the Most High granted... Uh, Ezra's petition, and this is what happens. And my mouth was opened and was no longer closed. And the Most High gave understanding to the five men. And by turns, they wrote what was dictated in characters which they did not know. I wonder what languages they wrote in. They sat 40 days and wrote during the daytime and ate their bread at night. As for me, I spoke in the daytime and was not silent at night. Now listen, this, this is incredibly important. We're again, I'm going to pause here real quickly. We're right here. Uh, again, the claim is is that the that the Most High has a closed canon that does not include First Enoch. And here we go. Listen to this. So during the forty days, ninety four books were written. Ninety four. And when the forty days were ended, the Most High spoke to me, saying, "Make public the twenty four books that you wrote first, and let the worthy and unworthy read them." But keep the 70 that were written last in order to give them to the wise among your people. For in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the river of knowledge. And I did so. So truly, it is the glory and the right of Yahuwah to conceal and reveal anything according to his will. This passage in 2 Ezra is the closest thing we have to Scripture informing us about any official canon by Yahuwah. Otherwise, it's purely speculation or based off of what man has decreed. This came straight from the mouth of Yahuwah to the prophet Ezra. It's also interesting that the Tanakh, or the Hebrew Bible, includes 24 books. So remember up here it said, and uh, make public the 24 books that you wrote first and let the worthy and un unworthy read them. So, And he's like, anyone can read these, right? So it's interesting that the Hebrew Bible includes 24 books. These 24 are the same as the 39 books we have in our modern day Bibles, just condensed. For example, we have 12 separate books for the 12 minor prophets. However, in the Tanakh, they are counted as one book and other books likewise are condensed into one volume. So the, this is an amazing prophecy that came true. The Most High said, you make these pub make public these 24 books, right? But there are 70 other books that were kept hidden for the wise. So as we stated earlier, we believe this passage confirms that Enoch is a treasure and a reward for those who diligently seek it out. Unfortunately, most won't even test it because of the fences and warnings placed around it by scholars, pastors, and teachers. Make public the 24 books that you wrote first and let the worthy and the unworthy read them. But keep the 70 that were written last in order to give them to the wise among your people. Just keep in mind, 
I'm not saying this. This is what Scripture is saying. This is what the Most High is saying. So let's get to this. Jude quotes Enoch, the implications. So here we'll read on the left, Jude 1, 14 through 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the master comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them and all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and have all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, here's first Enoch, and you'll notice he quotes it verbatim. And behold, he comes with ten thousands of his holy ones, or saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to destroy all the ungodly, and to convict all flesh of all their, I'm sorry, and to convict all flesh of all their works, of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Jude, this is the brother of our master Yahusha, quoted directly from First Enoch chapter 1. I don't think that can be understated. So Jude is doing two things here. He, number one, proclaims Enoch to be a prophet by his own words, right? Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things. So when you prophesy, you are a prophet. So he proclaims Enoch to be a prophet by his own words. Number two, gives first Enoch credibility of being inspired by Yahuwah. Some say Jude quoting Enoch is not an indication of, of its authenticity, nor proves it's divinely inspired. However, in love, we disagree. Jude quoted a prophecy from Enoch verbatim. This is no light matter. This is not equivalent to uh, Paul in the book of Acts saying, uh, quoting uh, the Athenians uh, to the unknown Elohim. Uh, he's, he was referencing one of their uh, pagan statues, uh, which gave reference to a, an unknown God. This is not the same thing. This is not even close to the same level. He quotes a prophecy from Enoch. This is no light matter. Jude would have been very acquainted with Deuteronomy 13. This is a clickable link if you guys want to read that. And the fate of the false prophet, which is death by stoning. Jude would have to be sure that the words preserved in the book of Enoch were genuine. Otherwise, he would be promoting a false prophet. Some have speculated that Jude was referencing an oral tradition, but we believe this to be a massive stretch. As we learn from the book of Judges, it only took one generation to depart from the truth. And actually, uh, likewise, the, the Chronicles and the Kings, you'd have a righteous king and then you'd have an unrighteous king. And everything changed in one generation. A quote so precise as this would have to have be preserved. Or I'm sorry, a quote so precise as this would have to have had to be preserved in writing. Sorry, that's terrible English there. But it, it, seriously, but think about it. To, in order to get a quote that specific, it would have to be preserved somewhere in writing. And speaking of oral traditions, Yahushua didn't seem to be too impressed with oral traditions anyway. So I don't think Jude, the brother of Yahushua, would be have any interest in oral traditions. Lastly, some teachers recognize the value of Jude quoting First Enoch, but stop short of vindicating the work. They stand on vague speculations of scholars who say the book was compiled by many authors over different time periods. Since there is no evidence for these claims, but rests purely on opinions, look that up for yourself, this foundation is built on sand. Scholars have importance, no doubt, and retain a vital function in the body. However, we believe many modern-day scholars rely too heavily on carrying on the traditions and opinions of those who served the same office before them. Paul says this is the qualification for Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 15-17. And that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Messiah Yahusha. All Scripture is given by inspiration of Elohim and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Upon a thorough investigation of this book, all qualifiers are met. This book gives constant exhortation for the reader to return to the commandments of Yahuwah, to walk in righteousness according to the law of Elohim. It contains wisdom regarding the calendar that is not found anywhere else. Lastly, and most notably, this book contains the clearest understanding of Messiah as the son of Yahuwah, who was with him from the very beginning. This should pique the interest of every follower of Messiah. So Enoch sees the Messiah, the son of Yahuwah. Let's go to Enoch, 1st Enoch 48, 5 through 7. So Enoch is taken up into heaven in a vision, and here he goes. 
And at that hour, that Son of Man, which we know is a term for or a title for our Messiah. So at that hour, that Son of Man was named in the presence of Yahweh Sebaot, so Yahweh of Spirits, and his name before the head of days. Yes, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of heaven were made, his name was named before Yahweh of Spirits. He shall be a staff to the righteous, whereon to stay themselves and not fall. So like a support. And he shall be the light of the Gentiles, and the hope of those who are troubled of heart. All who dwell on the earth shall fall down and worship before him, and will praise and bless and celebrate with song Yahuwah of spirits. And for this reason, he has been chosen and hidden before him, before the creation of the world and forevermore. This book reveals and solidifies the deity of Messiah, that he is Elohim. He's no mere man. He was no mere man. Although he came as a man, he was no mere man. He was an eternal being that came in, into the flesh, which is what the scriptures teach us, the, the Bible, the canon. And the wisdom of Yahuwah's spirits has revealed him to the holy and righteous. This confirms what John 6, 4, 4 says, that no one can, Messiah is saying, no one can come to me except the Father draw him. And then he says, I'll raise him up in the last day. Hallelujah. So it says here again, just, and the wisdom of Yahuwah's spirits has revealed him, Messiah, to the holy and righteous. For he has preserved the lot of the righteous because they have hated and despised this world of unrighteousness and have hated all its works and ways in the name of Yahuwah of spirits. Listen to this. For in his name they are saved. And according to his good pleasure has it been in regard to their life. And again, that was 1 Enoch 48, 5 through 7. Did anyone else see the gospel in Enoch 48? I did. Hallelujah. Let's also check out chapter 46 in 1 Enoch. And there I saw one who had a head of days, and his head was white like wool. This is the father. And with him was another being whose countenance had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of graciousness, like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me and showed me all the hidden things concerning that Son of Man. So let's pause here real quickly on the Son of Man. So we see the Father, and we see another being next to him who is that Son of Man. Who he was, and whence he was, and why he went with the head of days. And he answered and said unto me, This is the Son of Man who has righteousness, with whom dwells righteousness, and who reveals all the treasures of that which is hidden. Because Yahuwah of spirits has chosen him, whose lot has the preeminence. He is higher, right? He's higher in stature than all man and all the angels. So, and whose lot has the preeminence, whoops, before Yahuwah of spirits and uprightness forever. And this son of man whom you have seen shall raise up the kings and the mighty from their seats and the strong from their thrones and shall loosen the reins of the strong and break the teeth of the sinners. And he shall put down the kings from their thrones and kingdoms because they do not extol and praise him, nor humbly acknowledge whence the kingdom was bestowed upon them. And he shall put down the countenance of the strong and shall fill them with shame and darkness shall be their dwelling and worms shall be their bed and they shall have no hope of rising from their beds because they do not extol the name of Yahuwah of spirits. First Enoch 46, 1 through 6. So reading Enoch 46 and 48 gives us a clear picture. Enoch was taken into heaven in a vision and saw Yahuwah and Yahusha standing at his right side. This gives us a better understanding and a basis of what the Apostle John recorded. John 1, 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, we know this is Messiah, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things that were made by him, I'm sorry, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made that was made. So, Again, this also ties into Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. When you look at the Hebrew word Elohim, it's the plural of Eloha. This word Elohim is plural, indicating more than one being. Genesis 1.26 said, And Elohim, plural, said, Let us, this Hebrew word in Hebrew is plural, make man in our image, plural, after our likeness. This is exactly what Enoch saw. He saw the Father and the Son in heaven. And John recorded that everything that was made was made through Messiah. And it says here in Genesis that the Father and the Son, they said, hey, let's make man in our image after our likeness. So truly, 
Messiah Yahushua has been with the Father since the beginning, and Enoch solidifies this fact with a clear picture. Even so, an apparent issue arises in chapter 71, also known as the Son of Man discrepancy found in Enoch 71.14. Let's discuss it. So even though chapter 46 and 48 are clear about Enoch seeing a vision of Yahuwah and his son, who wasn't Enoch himself, it was spoken in a third-person sense, there arises a discrepancy in chapter 71. Let's read it. Enoch 71, 14 and 15. And he came to me and greeted me with his voice and said unto me, You are the Son of Man who is born unto righteousness. And righteousness abides over him, and the righteousness of the head of days forsakes him not. And he said unto me, He proclaims unto you peace in the name of the world to come. For from hence has he um, has proceeded peace since the creation of the world, and so it shall be unto you forever and ever and ever. So on the surface, this appears to be problematic, as this translation is pointing at Enoch as the Messiah. However, let's consider a few things. Throughout the book, this son of man is always portrayed as someone else other than, other than himself, except in 7114. In fact, the previous chapter, 70, presents the Son of Man in third person, as in not Enoch himself. So Enoch 71 through 2, and it came to pass after this that his name during his lifetime was raised aloft to that Son of Man and to Yahuwah of spirits from amongst those who dwell on the earth. And he was raised aloft on the chariots of the spirit, and his name vanished from among them. So this is literally saying that Enoch, of course, was taken into the heavens, much like uh, um, Elijah was, excuse me. And it says that he was raised to that son of man and to Yahuwah Sebaot, which we read in, of course, uh, 46 and uh, 48, just a moment ago. So, <clears throat> now on the surface, this appears problematic. Oh, I'm sorry. We just read that. Okay. So, we have multiple witnesses. We have over three witnesses in this book that the Son of Man is was spoken about in third person, as in someone that's not Enoch himself. But we have one that apparently shows that Enoch is that Son of Man. So, we have three witnesses that say one thing, and we have one witness that says something else. Obviously, I think a lot of you know where I'm going with that. However, even to go further than that, is it possible there was a scribal error in 7114? Perhaps at worst, maybe tampering, maybe someone deliberately did that? I don't know. It seems so, or at least that there is at least a scribal error, as the rest of the book, more than three witnesses, teach us that Enoch is not the Messiah. Should we throw out the book for an error like this? Consider what is written in Matthew, the story of Judas and the 30 pieces of silver for a moment. Matthew 27, 5 and 9. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Of course, this is talking about Judas. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value. Some of you are saying, like, well, okay, so what? This is an error and a contradiction, as Zechariah was given this prophecy, not Jeremiah. Zechariah 11, 12-13. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And Yahweh said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of Yahuwah. So, what do we do with this? Those who are rooted in faith are not shaken at all, realizing it was a simple scribal error, or at worst, an alteration. So hopefully I didn't lose you here. So again, in Matthew 27, it referenced that Jeremiah the prophet prophesied about these 30 pieces of silver, but that's wrong. It was Zechariah. So I think most people that believe the Bible is true would say, well, that's just a scribal error, right? So needless to say, we aren't ready to throw the book of Matthew out over this. Well, I'm not at least. Deuteronomy 25, 15, but you shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shall you have, that your days may be lengthened in the land which Yahweh Elohim gives you. So while this scripture, and there's many others like it, relate to a physical scale, shouldn't we be able to glean a spiritual meaning? To put it bluntly, if we give place for errors in the 66 book canon, we should have equal weights and measures of judgment when it comes to testing first Enoch. 
With this in mind, I don't find it too hard to chalk up or to chalk Enoch 71 as an error in the same way as what we saw in Matthew, especially considering Messiah taught from Enoch and even rebuked the Sadducees for not knowing about the contents of it. So let's discuss this. Messiah does, in fact, teach from Enoch. In Matthew 22, the Sadducees attempted to get into a doctrinal dispute with Messiah regarding the resurrection. Bad move. And we'll find out here in Acts 23.8 that it's because they didn't believe in the resurrection. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they came to Messiah with a story. It's like, ha, 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 we're going to trap him. Watch this. So as a matter of fact, the main reason the Sadducees didn't believe in such, the resurrection or angels, was due to the fact that they only believed the first five books, the Torah, that's uh, Genesis through, uh, through Deuteronomy. Um, they only believed the first five books were inspired. They boxed themselves in with their own theology and wouldn't allow true, doc true doctrine from Yah to be formed from the writings, which is like Psalms, Proverbs, etc. Or the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, they didn't believe these were scripture. And of course, the rest. I just wonder if some today are inadvertently doing the very same thing, as in boxing themselves, uh, boxing themselves in with their own theology, not even allowing themselves to truly test this book or even uh, fairly, uh, fairly weigh out the evidence. Okay, so back to Matthew 22. In this interaction, the Sadducees came to Messiah and trying to test him, tell a story about a woman who married a man who died and left no children. Per the Torah, if a woman is widowed and childless, the deceased husband's brother is to take her as a wife and bring up children in his brother's stead. The story continues. So now we're at Matthew 22, 25 through 28. So this is the Sadducees speaking uh, or telling the story. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. So they're saying that this woman married seven brothers, all of them died, none of them left to children. So now they're saying, so therefore, so this is the challenge of, <laughs> there's no resurrection, watch, she won't be able to answer this. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, here is Messiah's response, or rather, rebuke. This is Matthew 22, 29 through 30. Yehusha answered and said to them, You are in error, listen to this carefully, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of Elohim. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of Elohim in heaven. We can't not overlook the fact that Messiah rebuked the Sadducees for not knowing the scriptures. Wouldn't you find it interesting that nowhere in the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, exist any teachings regarding angels not being created to marry, as in none at all. Literally n nothing exists in the Bible. Remember, the New Testament, some of you are like, well, well, Luke says this. Remember, the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, was not written yet. I find it fascinating that only in the book of Enoch do we find the answer to this mystery regarding the angels marrying in heaven. In chapter 15, Enoch is given a vision that provides the basis for the rebuke Messiah gave. However, before we go there, so we'll get to this in a second, we must back up just a moment. As we mentioned at the beginning of the study, Enoch is filled with important truths. So revealed in this book is the fall of Satan and the angels known as the Watchers. These angelic beings were supposed to look after and even intercede for man. However, these angels conspired against Yahuwah and rebelled against the natural order of things. They took human wives, mating with them, and created giants, something we see briefly spoken about in Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto, him, unto them, that the sons of Elohim, Benai Elohim, the same term used in Job when we see angels and Satan uh, presenting themselves before the Most High that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of old, men of renown. These are actual skeletons that were found um, through excavations. We're not going to get into that, but just to um, 
solidify that this is a true, true documentation. These angels also taught men and women how to sin. This is Enoch, first Enoch chapter 8. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures. And there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Semyaza taught enchantments and root cuttings, Armaros, the resolving of enchantments, Barakihal taught astrology, Kokabel the constellations, Ezekiel the knowledge of the clouds, Arakiel the signs of the earth, Shamsiel the signs of the sun, and Sarel the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. Just a quick side note, if anyone wondered how NASA and the governments know about the eclipses and other astronomical events before they happen, this is the origin of that information. There's so much more on this we would love to share, but let's get back to the point. Enoch 15 and the basis of Messiah's rebuke to the Sadducees. So we had to lay the foundation that these angels came down and um, they, they committed fornication. They slept with what human women, created giants, all these things that were not ordained for them to do. So now let's go to Enoch, 1st Enoch 15, 1 through 7. Here we will get the basis of Messiah's rebuke. Or rather, hey, you, he's like, I can't believe you don't know in the resurrection they don't marry or are given in marriage, but they're like the angels of heaven. This is the basis of that information. And he answered me and said to me, I heard his voice, fear not, Enoch, you righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Approach here and hear my voice and go, say to the watchers of heaven, you have sent you who have sent you to, I'm sorry, who have sent you to intercede for them. You should intercede for men and not men for you. Wherefore or why have you left the high, holy and eternal heaven and lain with women and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men and taken to yourselves wives and done like the children of earth and begotten giants as your sons? And though you were holy, spiritual, living the eternal life, which is what happens in the resurrection, you have defiled yourselves with the blood of women and have begotten children with the blood of flesh. And as the children of men have lusted after flesh and blood, as those also do who perish, die and perish, therefore I have given them wives also that they might impregnate them and beget children by them, that thus nothing might be wanting to them on the earth. But you were formerly spiritual, living the eternal life, and immortal for all generations of the world, and therefore I have not appointed wives for you, for as the spiritual ones in heaven, in heaven is their dwelling. First Enoch 15 states that in the heavenly realm there is no marriage, and angels were not ordained for such. Brothers and sisters, First Enoch is the only known text in existence that Messiah could have been rebuking the Sadducees for not knowing the scriptures in relation to being like the angels in the resurrection who were not ordained to marry. There's just nothing else. It doesn't exist. The point being made here by Messiah, angels were not made for marriage. Remember, Yahushua answered and said to them, You are in error, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of Elohim. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of Elohim in heaven. Yahushua has two parts to his rebuke. No marriage in heaven, which we just covered. Then the resurrection itself, which is separate from the knowledge of angels not being authorized for procreation. Here's a couple of verses later. Matthew 22, 31-33. So at first he says, for the resurrection, they are neither given in marriage. Now, then he says, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, so the next thought, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by Elohim, saying, I am the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Jacob? Elohim is not the Elohim of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude had heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Had the Sadducees read and believed the words of First Enoch, they wouldn't have been in error for not knowing the scriptures regarding marriage in heaven. Likewise, they wouldn't have challenged Messiah dealing with the existence of a resurrection found in Exodus. Exodus 3.6, Moreover, he said, I am the Elohim of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, the Elohim of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon Elohim. If our great king teaches and rebukes from Enoch, then it's certainly worth worthy of at least testing, brothers and sisters. So Peter teaches from Enoch. Peter, the fisher of men, taught from Enoch. 
Through the book of 2 Peter, we can validate 1 Enoch as authentic and trustworthy. 2 Peter 2.4, For if Elohim spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Once again, brothers and sisters, there is no other text that Peter could be getting his understanding about angels sinning and being cast down into hell to Sheol other than First Enoch. Let's read about it. This is, a, this is First Enoch 10, 4 through 7, and 11 through 14. And again, Yahweh said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot, and cast him into the darkness, and make an opening in the desert which is in Dudael, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and cover his face that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment he shall be cast into the fire, and heal the earth which the, er the angels have corrupted, and proclaim healing of the earth, that they may heal the plague, and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. And Yahweh said unto Michael, Go, bind Semyaza and his associates, who have united themselves with, with women, so as, so as to have defiled themselves with them with all their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for seventy generations in the valley of the earth, till the day of their judgment and of their consummation, till the judgment that is forever and ever is cons consummated. In those days they shall be led off to the abyss of fire, and to the torment and the prison in which they shall be confined forever. And whosoever shall be condemned and destroyed will from thenceforward be bound together with them to the end of all generations. So here we see the binding of the angels locked into the prisons of the earth. This is what he says right here. This is what Peter's talking about. For if Elohim spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell or Sheol and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That's literally what we just read. There's no other text, brothers and sisters, that, that Peter can be pulling from. As a side note, Jude also teaches the very same concept derived from 1 Enoch alone. This is Jude 1, six, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So, can we just reason with one another for a moment? Please recognize that Peter spent a considerable amount of time with Messiah. Like, they hung out quite a bit. Don't you think at some point Yahushua would have told Peter and Jude to stay away from first Enoch if it wasn't inspired? Remember, Messiah knows the end from the beginning. He would have known Peter and Jude would eventually write about the information found in Enoch and would have had the foreknowledge to warn or rebuke them if it was in fact a false book. However, that's not what happened. And the scriptures leave us a trail of evidence leading to the wisdom found in the book of Enoch. So, perhaps those who say Enoch contains truth, but is not a complete work, or shouldn't be trusted, are actually the ones who question whether or not Yahuwah can keep his word intact. Let's talk about some manuscript evidence in the Ethiopic Bible. There is a considerable amount of manuscript evidence available to us. Let's share the list found here. These are all clickable links. Every time you see red here on this website, it's a cl clickable link. So in the Ethiopic, the most extensive surviving early manuscripts of the Book of Enoch exist in the Ge'ez language, Ge'ez or Ge'ez language. R.H. Charles' critical edition of, the of 1906 subdivides the Ethiopic manuscripts into two families. So anyways, I'm not going to go over every single line here, but you can, uh, like I said, everything we're covering is in an article. You can go back and look at all these different manuscripts. But you can see here, just in the Ethiopic, how many manuscripts exist. And then here, family B, all these different manuscripts exist. And these are some early, early, early manuscripts here. The Aramaic. 11 Aramaic language fragments of the Book of Enoch were found in Cave 4 of Qumran. Look at all these manuscripts, brothers and sisters. And, and so some people will say, well, maybe just the first book, the Book of the Watchers, was inspired, but the rest is not. This, they found a good portion of the entire book. Just little fragments, of course, but they were able to compare these fragments with existing manuscripts to see that the they, they coincided and were the same. This gives confirmation to the whole work, brothers and sisters. Look at the Greek. Uh, again, I'll let you. I'll let you all go through all this manuscript evidence. Um, but yeah, it's all here for your, for your own research here. The the Coptic, the Coptic, um, 
not a whole lot there, but it does exist. There's also a little bit in the Latin um, exist as well. You can see here yet they found the front of the book and the end of the book. So there's some uh, that exists in the Syriac. Now the Ethiopic Bible, this is another interesting topic here. First Enoch is part of the biblical canon used by the Ethiopian Jewish community Beta Israel as well as the Christian Ethiopian Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahat Tewahedo Church. Sorry, I'm probably butchering that. Now keep in mind, um, we'll just keep going. So the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahado Church is the largest of the Oriental Orthodox churches. Orthodox churches, one of the few Christian churches in the sub-Saharan Africa origin originating before European colonization of the continent. Anyways, I'll let you guys go over um, it's your own uh, leisure to go over this, but I just wanted to share this, that a lot of manuscript evidence exists. This is not just some uh, just some book, you know, found in a corner here and, and, and we're elevating it. This is, this has a lot of manuscript evidence. So uh, early church fathers, and I loosely quote church fathers uh, in Enoch. Let's quickly take a look at the opinions of Enoch through the early church historians slash scholars. Please take note, I do not hold this information nearly as important as everything else we've covered thus far. Nevertheless, it is evidence to add to the discussion. So let's start with Tert Tertullian. An early church father and founder of Latin Christianity wrote a few positive things concerning the book of Enoch. Tertullian writes as follows in his second century work on the apparel of women, 1, uh, 3, 1 through 3. So here we go. Here's a quote. I am aware that the scripture Enoch, which has assigned this order of action to angels, is not received by some because it is not admitted into the Jewish canon either. I suppose they did not think that, having been published before the deluge, it could have safely survived that worldwide calamity, the abolisher of all things. If that is the reason for rejecting it, let them recall to their memory that Noah, the survivor of the deluge, was the great-grandson of Enoch himself, and he, of course, had heard and remembered from domestic renown and hereditary tradition concerning his own great-grandfather's grace in the sight of Elohim and concerning all his preachings since Enoch had given no other charge to Methuselah than that he should hand on the knowledge of them to his posterity. Noah, therefore, no doubt, might have succeeded in the trusteeship of his preaching, or, had the case been otherwise, he would have not have been silent alike concerning the disposition of things made by Elohim, his preserver, and concerning the particular glory of his own house. If Noah had not had this conservative power by so short a route, there would still be this consideration to warrant our assertion of the genuineness of this scripture. He could equally have renewed it, under the Spirit's inspiration, after it had been destroyed by the violence of the deluge, as, after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians storming it, every document of the Jewish literature is generally agreed to have been restored through Ezra. This is amazing because this confirms exactly what the book of Second Ezra asserted, that Ezra was given the task or the, the privilege or the right of rewriting everything. But since Enoch in the same scripture has preached likewise concerning the, the master, nothing at all must be rejected by us which pertains to us. And we read that every scripture suitable for edification is divinely inspired. By the Jews it may now seem to have been rejected for that very reason, just like all the other portions which nearly tell of Messiah. And I'll just want to pause there really quickly. I personally believe that's ultimately why the Jews rejected it is because it's literally one of the most messianic books you can ever read in the the, the Tanakh that is or I'd say when I'd say Tanakh I mean uh, what we would call Old Testament books written before Messiah. First Enoch is one of the most messianic books. So he's so Tertullian is saying the same thing that he's uh, hypothesizing that um, the Jews rejected it, which tell of Messiah. Nor, of course, is this fact wonderful that they did not receive some scriptures which spoke of him, whom even in person, speaking in their presence, they were not to receive. To these considerations is added the fact that Enoch possesses a testimony in the Apostle Jude. So, it's a pretty, uh, pretty lengthy uh, um, quote here, but I think it's very telling, brothers and sisters. So, those of you that uphold the opinions of scholars in high regard, why not scholars that lived... Uh, almost uh, 1,800 years, 1,900 years closer to Messiah than we were. Irenaeus, 
And for a very long while, wickedness extended and spread and reached and laid hold upon the whole race of mankind until a very small seed of righteousness remained among them. And illicit unions took place upon the earth since angels were united with the daughters of the race of mankind. And they bore to them sons who for their exceeding greatness were called giants. And the angels brought as presents to their wives, teachings of wickedness, and that they brought them the virtues of roots and herbs, dyeing in colors and cosmetics, the discovery of rare substances, love potions, aversions, amours, concupiscence, constraints of love, spells of bewitchment, and all sorcery and idolatry hateful to Elohim, by the entry of which things into the world evil extended and spread, while righteousness was diminished and enfeebled. This is Irenaeus, the proof of the apostolic preaching, 18, this is 2nd century. So obviously we can see here, Irenaeus is quoting or is referencing what is quoted in the book of Enoch. And uh, lastly, Barnabas, this is the epistle of Barnabas, 16, uh, five through six, first century work. Again, it was manifest that the city and the temple and the people of Israel were to be delivered up. For the scripture says, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the master shall deliver the sheep of his pasture and the sheepfold and their tower to destruction. This is condensed from Enoch 89, 54 through 56. You don't find this anywhere else other than Enoch. What, what Barnabas just was just quoted. And it took place according to what the master said. But let us inquire if a temple of Elohim exists. Yes, it exists where he himself said that he makes and perfects it. For it is written, and it shall come to pass when the week is ended, that a temple of Elohim shall be built gloriously in the name of the master. This is again similar to Enoch 93, 6-7 with the apocalypse of the weeks. So other information in First Enoch, a quick bullet point list of what the book of Enoch also reveals. And it's not limited to this. This, this is just some of the standout things that I could remember off the top of my head. Messiah is an eternal being who's been with the Father since the beginning. Vital. Angels rebelled and sinned, mating with women and created giants. These fallen angels became as gods to the people or as Elohim to the people, teaching them technology and sin. The origin of demons and evil spirits, which really quickly, if you're wondering when those giants died, their spirits were not like the spirits of men because they were partly angel. They were partly human. There was no uh, habitation of rest down in Sheol made for them. So they went about wandering the earth and persecuting men and women. Descriptions of heaven, hell or Sheol and earth. The heavenly luminaries, the movements and patterns of the sun moon, and stars. This book challenges modern-day science regarding true cosmology. Yahuwah's heavenly calendar, the sun, the moon, and the stars, is only in Enoch. There's, there's little bits and pieces that we can get from the 66-book canon, but truly the actual teachings of how the calendar works, it's only found in Enoch. A call to righteousness by keeping the commandments of Yahuwah. Salvation in the name of the Son of Man the identity of the archangels, and much more. There's so much more to say on this book, but we hope it is enough, or at least we've presented enough evidence for you to read it and test it for yourself. We do believe it will bless you abundantly. We pray this this study was of value to you. <clears throat> Matter of fact, let's just pray real quick. Heavenly Father, Yahweh Most High, we just come before you and bless you in your son, Yahushua's name. Father, we thank you for preserving your word for us in these last days. We thank you for restoring the scriptures through Ezra that we may uh, find the path to life in these last days. Father, I pray that this study would bless someone, maybe who's someone who's on the fence, who's studying this out and doesn't really know what's the truth. Father, I pray that this study would be a blessing to them. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would co would convict and and show the truth of this book, Father. We love you and thank you so much and rejoice in your son, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Yahweh will bless you and keep you. Yahweh will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh will lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, a.k.a. peace. So, let's end with a, uh, a quick song. And, um, yeah, let's see. Let's go with this one. One, two, one, two, three, four.
prepare the way All these people make straight a path For Yeshua's coming back So we lift up as the mighty boys Hosanna, hallelujah Hosanna, hallelujah Prepare the way All these people make straight a path For Yeshua's coming back So we lift up Calling 